So I have a few announcements to make before we get started. One of them is please silence your cell phones if you haven't done so already so it doesn't distract people or our speaker. Another thing is we have a donation box by the door. So donations and memberships do keep us going. We've been around since 1925 and we rely heavily on donations for keeping us going. So we appreciate everything. And there's a log book by the door that you walked in. If you haven't signed it already, we do keep track of how many people come to our events. So if you could sign that on your way out, that would be excellent. Also, on the refreshments table, there's a schedule for the month of July. I am lacking one speaker right now, so if you or someone else you know would love to give a talk, um, I do have an opening in July and one in October. And the topics are on there, but not necessarily the title of the program. So one last thing before I introduce our speaker, and we just got an exhibit which was at the Cortland Free Library, it's from the South Central Regional Library Council, and it's on women's suffrage. There are five panels in the dining room, and I have to apologize, we had a meeting in the dining room, so there is a mess in there, <laughs> but you're more than welcome to go down to the museum and check out these panels. They're very nice, they tell a great story. So. Our speaker today is Andrea Rankin. She was very nice to say yes to me <laughs> to speak about women's suffrage, or women in the Victorian area. And um, I'm just going to run down a few of the things that Andrea has done because she's had an amazing career. She was the director at the Jacobus Center for 25 years, spearheaded the ZAP program, which if you don't know what that is, it's zero adolescent pregnancy. And uh, at the time, First Lady Hillary Clinton visited Portland. I remember taking my then baby to see just because she was a First Lady and what an opportunity. Uh, she also went to Nazareth College and obtained her master's from Cornell. She was elected to city council three times and in 1978 was the founding mother of the YWCA's ABV, which is Domestic Violence Rape Prevention Program. She fought to protect, protect a prime recharge area of the aquifer in Portlandville um, with citizens for aquifer protection and employment. She was on the CAPCO Board of Directors from 2009 to 2014, the YWCA Board of Directors 2015 to present, and the Habitat, Habitat for Humanity Board of Directors 2006 through 2013. She's also working with Elsie Gutches to prepare her women's history collection for Open Door which I think she's going to talk about a little bit. So please welcome Andrea. Thank you so much for coming. Mm -hmm. Sounded like a laundry list. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for coming. I'm really excited to be here. And uh, the presentation I'm going to do is an outcome <coughs> of Women's History Month. And every year, Elsie Gutches and I uh, put together a display of 10 great women that nobody knows about because women have not uh, made their place in history. They've either been uh, a footnote or a, ca a closed caption or something like that. So Elsie Gutches has been somebody who has said, we're going to bring women back into history. And she started a collection of, in uh, 1980. And it was called Great Women in the United States. And she was going to have a column like Ripley's Believe It or Not every day in the newspaper about a great woman so that we could know more about her. Anyways, this is a picture of Elsie. <laughs> Elsie's not doing too well. She's um, almost 89. So she's, uh, she and I still work together. And I'm hoping that she will be alive when her library in uh, Open Door opens oh. in September. So let me just tell you a little bit about this. Um, Anybody who knows the Holland Stone Store Museum in Sherwood, New York, it's a very small museum, and in 1996, they discovered all these original suffrage posters rolled up in a ball up in the attic, stored there since 1920. So they said, oh my gosh, these are priceless. This is an incredible collection. We have to do something. So down the road was Isabel Holland's house. And it didn't look like that. It was falling down. And um, so they said, we should really bring this, rest, restore this house and um, keep the collection there. Elsie got involved because she wanted to have her women's, health, women's history collection stored someplace. So she now has 
a library. Oops, I'm on my way. Um, oops. <laughs> uh, this is uh, Elsie's library uh, with the French doors on the back of the building. Um, and it looks like uh, a rendition. Okay. Uh, freeze. Did I freeze it? Yeah. yeah. How do I unfreeze it? <laughs> <laughs> Hit the freeze again. Yeah. Escape. Me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, that do you want me to say? Yeah. Here it is. <laughs> okay. Now we're going right. There. Okay. So here is an artist's rendition of what this. Here's the French doors. Um, when you restore a house like this, you can't bring things that are old of the same vintage if, um, if they're not original to that house. So we are discovering uh, tiles on this library um, thing. And somebody came into an open house and said, I have a whole box of those yellow tiles. <laughs> and so people are bringing back pieces of this house that was empty for years. <coughs> so that they can be restored. So anyway, we have a much lovelier table. That's just, you know, a placement thing about. So this is what's happening. And here's a little flyer if anybody's interested in the progress. And Isabel Howland was um, the Howland Stone Store Museum. This is his niece. Uh, his first name is, does anybody remember? He's Emily Howland's father. And um, you pr I will refer to Emily later on. Uh, so. Okay. Okay. So I decided I would do something silly <laughs> and do a quiz show. So <coughs> this is going to be testing your metal here. Um, so I featured about seven women, and um, they're all born in the 1800s. And it is amazing to me when I look at all their bios how so many of them came out of uh, illiteracy, uh, couldn't read and write, uh, came from incredibly poor families, and yet were inc accomplished incredible things. So, my first quiz question. Oh, no, this is not. Uh, okay, basically, we're looking at rebel women of the 1800s. The, the, the Victorian era rejected um, had a very strong gender expectations of women. And so these women that I'm going to feature really had to struggle for professional status, status racial equality, justice, and sexual freedom. Um, because at that time, true woman had demanded that women were pious, <laughs> pure, submissive, and domestic. <laughs> None of our women came by these trips. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so in a world that's constantly trying to regulate female behavior, our rebel women stepped out of that box. So here is my first question. Who was the first woman to run for president of the United States? Just shout out an answer. Victoria Woodfall. Oh, very good. <laughs> A lot of kids will say, oh, yeah. Let me tell you about Victoria, who was gorgeous. Victoria flaunted every Victorian norm that ever was. She was a spokes ardent spokesperson for free love, for sexuality. She spoke and lectured on that uh, considerably. Um, let me go back to my... I just don't want to miss anything, because these women are something else. Uh, she was one of 10 siblings, born to an illiterate mother and a petty thief criminal father. Uh, she had no formal education. Her family moved a lot. You know what that does with educational goals. Um, in 1853, at age 15, she married a doctor who was an alcoholic and a philanderer. Mm -hmm. She didn't stay with him very long. Um, in 19, 1868, she moved to New York City with her sister. Her sister was um, named Claflin, and Victoria and uh, her sister 
did a newsletter letter called um, Woodhull and Claflin. And Elsie has actually several of the original copies of this <coughs> newsletter. But it was all about women's suffrage and um, sexual equality. She railed at the double standard and um, got in trouble about that a lot. <laughs> Anyways, she meets Cornelius Vanderbilt. He teaches her how to play the stock market. She becomes very good at playing the stock market. She uses her earnings from that to open a newspaper, which she, the Woodhull and Claflin. And then several years later, she opens her own brokerage firm. A woman in 1870 owning a brokerage firm on Wall Street is unheard of. In 72, two years later, she runs for president. Well, that was a joke. I mean, when did women get the vote? No. <laughs> so they didn't even count her. Thoughts. This is one of the women that ran for president of the one I'm going to feature. So that we probably don't know about. Um, she was jailed just before the election for printing obscene materials. And the obscene stuff was exposing Henry Ward Beecher as an adulterous hypocrite. Mm -hmm. Anyways, um, she often lectured on sex and free love and the rights of women to control their own bodies. But these were rare topics of public discourse at this time. Because of her ambitions, her radicalism, her love for the limelight, and the suffrage movement did not embrace Victoria. And um, Susan B. wrote <coughs> that both sisters are regarded as lewd and indecent. When Susan B. and Matilda Jocelyn Gage um, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote their comprehensive um, history of the women's suffrage movement in the 1880s, now Elsie has a six volume letter bound of that women's history, um, and that will go to the museum. Um, essentially, they wrote her out of history. They burned all her letters, all her programs, all her documents, and essentially she was persona nova. Okay, who was the first woman to present before the Supreme Court? This is a topic. So I'm not going to make you. No choices. Possible people. Belva Lockwood. <clears throat> she taught school at age 14. She was married at 18. She was widowed when she was 23. She knew she needed an education. She needed a college education. And even though she taught school at 14, she had no formal education. <clears throat> so she went on to get her college degree so she could support her daughter. She, became, she taught and then became the headmistress at Lockport Union uh, School. So I'm trying to pull a little like local history in and um, sort of show how these people had some influence in this area. She came under Susan B. Anthony's influence in terms of integrating women's needs into curriculum. And she started a co-ed school in Washington in 1866. If you remember our college in McGraw in the 1840s, it was revolutionary to be Korean and racially mixed. Um, in 1868, she married Lockwood, and he was a dentist and a clergy. <laughs> Picture that. And then she wanted to go to law school, so her husband definitely supported her in doing that. However, they wouldn't give her a degree because of her gender. She had to appeal to the President of the United States for her to get a degree. Then she used that degree to become the first person to be a member of the Supreme Court Bar. And then in 1880, uh, she was the first woman to present a case before the Supreme Court. Then, like uh, Victoria, she ran for um, president in 1884 at 1888 on the, and this is the first time that a person ran on a party line. The party was National Equal Rights Party. But, and she got lots and lots of votes in Pennsylvania and they just dumped them in the waste paper basket. So, that was the end of uh, her political career. 
This is what Velva looks like. A little more um, rigid than Victoria. <clears throat> but she really opened the political, legal uh, profession for women. Okay, the next person you'll just love. <clears throat> And I think I'm not giving you multiple choice on this either. <laughs> yeah. any, any guesses? Well, it's, I know it's Nathas, the black woman that did the... Uh, oh, uh, you just saw that program? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what was her name? Paul? You remember? I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> she did hair products, and she was the first black millionaire. Um, but that is not her. <laughs> okay. Hattie. Oh, Hattie was something to behold. She became an heiress in 1864 because of her, on uh, both sides of her family, they were involved in the whaling industry. So she, in 1864, inherited $6.75 million. <laughs> then her aunt died immediately after on her mother's side. So she got this from her father. Um, and she contested the will. And she, I think, it is known that she presented a forged will, and she then left the country because she was going to be arrested. So she <laughs> was very greedy. She wanted her aunt's entire estate, as well as her father's. So, um, <clears throat> so she fled to England with a husband, millionaire husband, Edward Green, and two kids to avoid those forgery charges. Then in 1875, she came back thinking the statute of limitation would have ended by that time. She was known to, this is the only elegant picture I have of her. This is her daughter getting married to a Vanderbilt or somebody, but um, Hattie was known for her bad hygiene. She would only clean the bottom of her skirt that got dirty in the road. She would not clean the whole thing. Her children were sent to school with cardboard in their shoes and hand-me-downs and second-hand clothes. Her son was in a, um, an accident, a, skating, or a sledding accident, and he injured his leg. She took him to a clinic. They recognized her because she was pretty well known as a rich woman, and she fled. Uh, shortly, not shortly, a couple years later, the son still had major problems and had to be amputated. Um, so, um, so hygiene was not her big thing. So she married this millionaire husband, but they never combined their money. And then he lost all his money in a stock market. And she moved out to New Jersey to a cold water flat. So, at $22 a month with her two kids. She's living in New Jersey so she can commute into Wall Street. She has a desk on Wall Street and that's where she earns her money. Um, she too had a little formal education. The only way that she knew about economics is she, because her grandfather was going blind, she read to him all the financial newspapers and then her father asked her to do the same thing for him. So she, at age six, she started educating herself. She encouraged young women to educate themselves and manage their own money, to invest money. Still, these are skills strikingly at odds with the social norms of the day. Um, but Hattie was on par with J.P. Morgan and Andrew Carnegie in terms of her investment skills. Um, she didn't speculate or buy on margin. She kept a large amount of assets and cash. She diversified in major ways with mortgages. She lent money to bankers and brokerage houses. Uh, several times during a uh, recession or almost depression in the 1907, Hattie bailed out New York City several times because she kept so much money in cash. So, and she obviously got a good return on that money she put to the city. So, in 1916, she died with 100 to 200 million dollars. Oh, she had worked at 6.7 into that. However, in today's terms, that would be anywhere from 2.4 to 4.6 billion dollars. Um, this was a true, amazing woman. 
Her rejection, however, of the trappings of her fortune, her rumpled and dirty appearances, and her ruthlessness mm -hmm. led her to become called the Witch of Wall Street. <laughs> <laughs> so, and she would even bring her oatmeal to work and cook it on her radiator. So, she was an amazing woman. <laughs> I am not proud of her. <laughs> okay, who is considered the Moses of her people? So, <clears throat> this portrait is a very early portrait and one of the rare ones of Harriet Tubman, and who knows where it was found. Yes, in one of Emily Holland's books. Yeah. They were close friends. I, I always say that Sherwood is the crossroads, and it's literally a crossroads with the cobblestone store on the corner. It's a crossroads between abolition and women's suffrage. It was a hotbed of radicalism right yeah. there. The Underground Railroad ran through there, Seward, Senator, or not Senator, Seward, um, and Holland were excellent, good friends. And, worked on the Underground Railroad together. Anyway, so uh, this could even be Harry, uh, um, Emily Holland's writing. I don't know, let me tell you a little bit about Emily. Um, she took her fortunes from her father, who had invested wisely, and after the um, Civil War, she knew that black people needed to have education, so she started a school, a number of schools throughout the South, in Washington, D.C. So she was very instrumental, Harriet, um, well, Emily Holland, in doing this. So you can see why they would be good friends, because their uh, allegiances would be right there together. Okay, who was born in Corning, New York, one of her mother's 18 pregnancies? <laughs> who do you think? <laughs> so I forgot to tell you that Harriet, Harriet Tubman was here as an impersonator and she was fabulous at the YWCA and she interacted with the kids for Martin Luther King's birthday. And the kids asked her so many questions like, did blacks own slaves? Um, what happens if you're running away and you can't see the North Star. And so she said, oh, you look at the tree and see where the moss is. I mean, these are five-year-old kids and six years old, seven years old. And, you know, did blacks own slaves? What is a master? I mean, just to have that interaction was the most, I mean, the audience just went crazy. They shut their mouths. They let the kids interact. There were about 40 kids. And it was wonderful. Anyway, so I, just to say that Harriet made 13 trips, bringing 70 people. You know, she escaped slavery. But she was there alone, so she went back to Maryland and pulled her people out of, <coughs> out of slavery. Um, she also worked in the Civil War as a cook, as a scout, and she led a major armed expedition of that war because she knew the area, she knew the terrain. Okay, Margaret, born in poverty, obviously, uh, attended college and nursing school. I mean, I don't know how that happened. Um, 1911, with her husband and three kids, she moved to New York City. Her interests went from raising kids to the more politics of, and socialism. She was very interested in socialism and, and politics. She wrote a columns like in the local newspaper, like what every mother should know, what every girl should know. And in 1916, she opened first birth control clinic and was promptly arrested. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the laws for mailing things uh, that talked about sexuality, the Comstock laws prevented any of that. And so Comstock was a fierce guy. And he, um, so birth control was considered obscene. Who's Comstock? Um, who's Comstock? He was the person who was so obsessed with purity. Was he near New York City? <clears throat> no, I think this was a federal law, the Comstock law. Okay. <clears throat> I think it was. Anyways, her arrest sparked all kinds of 
of, of support for birth control. Because um, it spoke to women. And um, another woman who was born in Corning at about the same time became one of her huge um, financial supporters. And her name was oh. Hepburn. And this was Audrey Hepburn's mother. Oh. 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 So, um, in 1950, Zanger got funding to give to Dr. Rock, a Catholic obstetrician, to develop the birth control pill. And the rest is history. Uh, in 1960, the pill came out and really changed a lot. Mm -hmm. so. OK. Here's our Margaret. She was a lovely lady. Mm -hmm. Accused of being a man who opened her blouse to reveal her breasts. So <laughs> Dolly Parton? <laughs> 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 Mary Walker? Who knows Mary Walker? Uh, so Mary Walker was a physician from Oswego, and she always dressed like a male. So you would you would certainly have expected. Her first husband lived here in Portland County. Oh. Mary Walker Snyder. Really? Yeah. That's a great piece of information. I love to connect local. <laughs> All right. So, it was Sojourner. Um, very briefly, she was one of the first women to speak out about abolition and women's rights. She was born in New York State in Ulster County. She was a slave in Ulster County. Born in 1797. Um, three times after age nine, she was sold. She was forcibly married. She bore five kids, one of, of which she was forcibly married to another slave, a, a much older slave, but one of her five kids was also her slave master's child. She was promised freedom um, in New York, but the owner reneged, so she escaped with her baby daughter. The amazing thing about Sojourner is that her, she left her fi a five-year-old son behind, as well as her other kids. <clears throat> she was the first woman ever to sue that her previous owner had sold her son to a uh, slave owner in Al Alabama against New York State laws. She was the first person to win a case against a white person. <clears throat> In, 19, in 1843, she changed her name to Sojourner Truth and became preaching and, and saw visions and uh, felt that it was her calling to do preaching. Um, and she was the person who gave the speech, Ain't I a Woman? You know, I called her and, and done the work of many men and Ain't I a Woman? Um, she could neither read nor write, but her story was dictated to a, a friend, and then William Lloyd Garrison published it as a narrative of Sojourner Truth, a northern slave. So again, northern slave. Kind of amazing. <clears throat> what famous sculptor attended New York Central College in McGraw, New York? Mm. You got it. So these actually are other sculptors. Lydia Strobridge, we know, right? Yes, both of them. Isn't there a historic marker in front of the house? Yeah. So another physician. And we know Amelia. We have a marker there, too. How about that? OK, so here's <laughs> why we should call Wildfire. Anybody know? <laughs> she was known as being wild. <laughs> <laughs> you would know that. Yeah. <laughs> Not personally, but. <laughs> okay, a very lovely Chippewa and black um, child, born very poor, maybe near Albany. People don't know her birthday, they don't know where she was born. Um, her mother and father died before she was age four. She was raised by her brother. She ended up going to our college. Yeah. Central. New York Central. Mm -hmm. So there's a picture of it. Um, then she went to Oberlin uh, for some art classes. In 1860, she meets um, William Lloyd Garrison, and she gains his support. And he 
apprentices her to a sculpture, a local sculpture, she becomes very politicized as well. She's fascinated with John Brown's raid and emancipation. And however, in 1867, she goes to Rome to study more uh, art. And um, she's known for the bust of uh, Lincoln. She's known for many ha ha. Hiawatha. This is an interesting piece of sculpture that was made for the 1876 Philadelphia Centennial, and it was also shown at Chicago Exposition. It was lost for 100 years. And where was it? It was at a grave site for a racehorse named Cleopatra. Oh. <laughs> so somebody finally found this and brought it, and now it's at the Smithsonian. So, one of her sculptures um, in 1870 sold for $6,000. That was Hagar, the uh, wife of uh, Abraham, and uh, second wife of Abraham, when Sarah couldn't have babies. Hagar came in. So. Anyway, so that was an unusual amount of money for that time. <coughs> Okay, which women attended the Women's Rights Convention in 1848 in Seneca Falls? Susan. Susan? Anybody else? Mine. Susan didn't come on the scene and meet um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony until 1853. There's a statue in Seneca Falls that shows Amelia Bloomer introducing I think the ladies. Yeah, the two ladies. Um, so, <clears throat> it is Lucretia Mott. She is a Quaker. Um, and in the Traker tradition, uh, men and women are considered equal. And she became eventually a clergy speaking throughout the country um, on women's rights and abolition. The pattern is very frequently that women become involved with the abolition movement and then realize that they're skunk and left out of these rights. So they um, then go on. And you can see one of the experiences that Lucretia Mott had was she was named to uh, be a delegate in 1840 to the Worldwide Anti-Slavery Convention in England. And she wasn't seated because she was a woman. I think um, somebody else was there with her. I can't remember who. But neither one of them were seated. So she really, uh, this was a politicizing moment for her. And so she launched into a campaign for women's rights. Um, in 1848, Jane Hunt, I think another Quaker, in Water Town? No. Waterloo, Waterloo. Um, invited Lucretia to attend the suffrage um, um, conference, convention. And she, with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, drafted the Declaration of Sentiments. Um, I love this about Lucretia, too. After the Civil War, she became a woman out doing voter registration among black people in the South. So um, she set the precedent for many civil rights workers in the 60s. Um, the one interesting thing is if uh, our Treasury, Secretary of Treasury, uh, does what he's supposed to do, <laughs> is put Harriet Tubman on a $20 <coughs> bill and put Lucretia Mott on a $10 bill. So let's hope that, and let's lobby for some nice pictures on the backs of those bills because these women deserve a place in history. Okay, so what is the most current name for a rebel woman, a woman who steps out of the box? Yes. I heard it. Master one? Yeah. <laughs> what was it? Oh, yes. Nasty woman. How many nasty women do you see here? Lots. <laughs> these are our freshman class. Um, how wonderful. It is very exciting to 
see how feisty, how colorful, and how pow just powerful these women are. So, okay, I can't believe I made it on time. <laughs> <laughs> I entertain any questions. How about uppity is a good word. Oh, but yes, you know, I was going to do that. I was going to have all these extra words. I mean, just think, uppity, um, shrill. <laughs> what are some other words women are used are used against women if they step out of the box? If I'm they sure I can think. Of I yeah. <laughs> people write them down. Feminist is a pretty negative connotation to like they use feminist to describe women. Like feminist is used as a dirty word. Yeah, the F word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, any other? Threat well, threatening. <laughs> yeah, ball busting. Yeah. <laughs> the museum in Sherwood, is that open on a regular basis? Do you know anything? The, are you talking about the stone store? Yes. This one? Yes. Okay. That is open on Thursday afternoons and Saturdays. And it's an absolute delight because Emily Holland, that was a very rich farmland, not unlike our Homer Valley there. Mm -hmm. And also Cornell Ag School influenced that whole area all along Cayuga Lake. And um, how we was it going with that? <laughs> what was the question? When they were open. When they were oh, open. yeah. Were open. Okay. So that's when they're open. Her, her travels. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> this has, um, if anybody knows um, Kathy Klimaszewski, who used to be at the 1890 house, and then went to Cornell and the Johnson Museum. She became the second in command at the Johnson Museum. Mm -hmm. Kathy is working with me and uh, on the Holland Stone Store Museum to put their collection in order. On the second floor of this museum, if anybody's been there, the stairs are horrendous. There is no bathroom in this building. There's you know, nothing but it has the treasures of, of a century. And Emily and her niece, Isabel, whose house the yellow is, um, traveled throughout Europe and Africa and brought back samples of things so that the farm wives who could not travel out of that region could see the world. <coughs> and so if anybody gets a chance to go and look at it's a, a box of curios. There is a shoe from China, from um, um, bound foot that is about that big. Um, there's sand. There are all kinds of wonderful things there. So it's worth the trip there. Plus they have regular programs during the summer uh, on Sunday afternoons. And so I'm going to pass this around because this Hollow is a cemetery is not too far from there. Yes, yes. Actually, this is very interesting because Elsie uh, Gutchess's maternal side had a farm right there. So it's like Elsie's collection is coming home. Oh. So it's really mm -hmm. wonderful. But here is um, the calendar they put out every year. And these are the posters that were found uh, are rolled up. Are you selling these? I'm not. That's <laughs> all one. I could. <laughs> but that's 18, I think. Yeah. So if, I, if people are interested, I can get a bunch of them from the store. Let me pass this around, too. This is, a, um, so this is what's happening with Open Door and the revitalization of this wonderful yeah. old building. And if you can, I mean, just look at how it used to look. And it was so neglected, and they tried for years to buy this building back, and they wouldn't let them. And meanwhile, everybody pilfered everything out of that building oh. to every fireplace, <clears throat> except for one because it had a collapse of part of the building onto that fireplace um, mantle. So they, in restoring, you can't bring in these other things. So what I'd like to do is put up a big sign saying, all those who borrow things from this building. Could you please return it? <laughs> so we could put it back yeah, where it belongs. I bet you people would do that. They would do that. I and think so. Especially children of people that mm. know the history. Right. I bet you, why don't you do I that? I think I put a sign up. Yeah. I will. 
because uh, in Elsie's library, there's little yellow tiles, and the woman came into one of the open houses and said, I have a box of those at home. <laughs> I said, bring them back. <laughs> So, anyways, for anybody who doesn't know where Sherwood is, it's about four miles over from Wells College. So it's on 34B, just right 34B in the whole area. And there will be an open house in June at Open Door. And she, um, Isabel called that house Open Door because it was the hub of women's suffrage in that area. Mm. And so from 1900 to 1920, when women got the whole vote, we got the vote in 17, way ahead of the um, amendment. And we celebrated that last two years ago. But, so open door meant, you know, everybody come. Pam, you know what it was? I was going to ask why you spelled it that way. So do you, uh, you know what? So yeah. yes, you know, it's more than I. It just was done like that, and so it stayed. So, but it's a, it's a very exciting thing, and Elsie's very excited, and I just got to keep her alive until it opens. <laughs> so there's an elevator in the new building, and it'll be just wonderful. So, and also, you now we're looking at furniture, and the um, Seidenbergs donated some wonderful stuff uh, from their uh, house to chairs. <laughs> Oriental dogs. So as much as they could, they preserved the wood on the floor. The doors are all numbered. All the woodwork, you know, it's all numbered. They just did a beautiful job. And it's all volunteer work. Every time there's a donation, the state will match it. So Elsie has naming rights and therefore got the library in her name. Um, and so that was matched. So basically, it's, uh, donations are doubled. So. I often wondered what happened about attitudes towards women if they were where a lot of this came from uh, early was in the Bible where God said to Adam, He said, you know, everything's gone to hell, what happened? And he said, Don't blame me, it was look at Eve. <laughs> so is that where some of these attitudes came from? Of course. Oh really? Let me read you something that is it. Um no, it's about uh, <laughs> okay. Oh, I forgot to read you. This, this is really the best piece. I don't know why I forgot. From a booklet that the Unitarian Church in Cortland put out on their centennial in 1936 is a description of Lucretia Mott, who spoke at that church, as well as Martin Luther King and a number of other um, dignitaries. But anyways. So, and I have not been able to verify this in any way. It is so juicy. Mott was one of 50 prisoners, and it gave the history of uh, Lucretia Mott. She spoke there, and then it gave her history in this uh, brochure, which Elsie <coughs> saved. Um, Mott was 50 prisoner, prisoners taken after the burning of the town of Schoharie by the Tories. She was compelled to disrobe. Her clothes were burned, two fingers and her right ear were chopped off. Oh yeah. She always wow. had a bonnet on. Um, and I've been searching and searching for a picture that shows her right side. <laughs> I haven't been able to find whether this is true or not. And she was left in the wilderness with wild animals. Somehow she made it out, survived, and became a quite pretty <coughs> And you know that that was so amazing. Oh, so she's safer in the woods. Good <laughs> 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 um, There was another piece I wanted to read you about. Yeah. The Christian at um, graduation in the New York Central College in 1853. Yeah. Say that again. Uh, um, spoke. Spoke. Um, oh! And um, there had been a smallpox epidemic that year. They weren't sure what was going to happen, whether they even had graduations. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether they asked her or she volunteered. We were involved with a bunch of kids on um, Teen Pregnancy Prevention app, and they were helping the cemetery oh, and found all uh -huh. those kids who died of smallpox. Yeah. Amazing.
questions. So, all right. Any more questions? Andrea. Yes. Going back mm -hmm. here, yes. sure. Sure. is the Stone House mm -hmm. and that Yellow House being? Are they both in Sherwood? They're three doors away from each oh. other. I mean, there's Sherwood is nothing. <laughs> it's a crossroads between <laughs> abolition <laughs> and suffrage. <laughs> right. It is a crossroads. <laughs> But think of, think of what happened there. There is our, when, when Kathy Klimaszewski went in to the Stone Storm Museum, she saw like this original slave passage ticket. And, the, the, and she was like in awe that it wasn't protected or that it was so vulnerable. So yeah, well, there so, is a building. I don't know whether it's still there. My father came from Team Ferry which is just a few miles down the road. And there, my cousin, and I don't know, I, she's the only one I know, had her children in this hospital, little, and is that building still there? I think it is across the street. Okay. The hotel is involved the in funding that, funding that okay. I think. There's a hotel on one corner if you're interested in buying a hotel and renting rooms. Uh, <laughs> you know? it, it needs it's a lot of work. Yes. <laughs> There's two buildings, one on each corner that are for sale, but they need a lot of work. Emily ho Emily's house has a, a historical marker, and it's just before you get to the Stone Street Museum. So. Can you put something in the paper to remind us about this happening in June? Right. Like oh, the open house? Editor no, or but I could, I could put something. Or Tabitha, there. you could do it through Facebook here. Maybe. Yeah, I could do it. Yeah. But you know, you can just, uh, it, don't look for Open Door, look for Howland Stone Storm Museum, mm -hmm. HSS. Do they have a Facebook page? Or a yes, page? and Open Door is on it, and you'll see the progress, and it's just fascinating. And these guys have been just wonderful. Uh, Beth Crawford is an architect right. out of uh, Syracuse. And yeah. oh, so Open Door's already gotten <coughs> architectural awards for saving this house. Mm -hmm. Who's it? Is Schickel doing the work? Is Schickel from Dryden doing the work? The Schickel mm -hmm. Company? Not to my knowledge. No, it's all Guy Guernsey is the guy who's kind of leading it. I mean the contractor? Uh, I think he's an architect, I'm not sure. But they're all retired. These guys just show up and they <laughs> insulate. And so it's geothermal. It's like yeah, uh, cool. insulated, like with mineral glass. Uh, I mean, it, it just paid a lot of attention to making it green and wonderful. Mm -hmm. So, so it's a great. It's going to be a great addition, and it's going to be on the trail. You're going to get to check off these things. You go to Harry Tubman, you go open door, and then you go to Seneca Falls. Why don't we get home around? <laughs> all right. <laughs> Any other questions? I love questions. <laughs>